But if we want to really start understanding what self-healing and self-regulation is, then we should realize that the involuntary processes of our body through the proper direction of the mind and not just the usage of one part of the mind but the total integral mind will give you the capacity of regenerating cell for cell. A lot of people use, and that sounds a little crude, but use disease as a very much of a moment of cellular, cellular suicide. And it is mostly because of the fear of change. The not being able to let go of that what was past and not having enough of a visionary idea what the future can bring for them. And so this stagnation. Now we are existing out of energy and when we start to understand that this energy needs to flow continuously in, through and out, that it cannot be stagnated, that every time then when we attach ourselves to a specific thought without giving it a chance to transform, that we stagnate thereby our process of becoming whole. And the whole meaning actually the being whole, the continuous state of transformation and giving actually energy to that so that it becomes a discharging rather than a charging. We are being charged continuously, but we discharge because we don't know what might be the result. And it's one of the things we have found that if you really want to do some self-healing and self-regulation, one of the first things is that you do not start to assume results. Because your results are already limiting the possibilities of the flow. Even the determination of what the result should be is a stagnation in itself and is a holding back of the transformation. So when we want to do self-healing, we have to first start realizing not so much who am I, but what am I? What am I? I am energy. What do I have in order to work with this energy? What directs it and what expresses it? Then we should realize that that energy, our essential beingness, is directed by that mind and not by the thinking mind as a questioning. You see, so self-regulation and self-healing, we also have another name for it, voluntary controls, meaning that we make the so-called involuntary physiological processes voluntary. And it is not done by thinking, by questioning, how am I going to do it? It is rather spontaneously giving in to that arousal state, that state of excitement, and to give it form. And not give it form within yourself, but form beyond yourself. To direct it outward. You hear a lot, and already in the introduction to the word, visualization was being brought out. I even have gone beyond that word visualization because it is again also very limiting. A lot of people who had the possibility and really made an attempt to start doing something to bring themselves to that level of consciousness what will bring forth that self-regulating and that self-healing, were told you need to visualize that what you want to achieve. And then if they didn't get cognitive pictures, they stopped it. They felt they were failing because they felt that they should see it as it is in the physical form. Not realizing that one becomes on a higher level of consciousness, the image has not necessarily achieved its structural part or has already gone through its structural part. But it becomes therefore a matter of perceptualization. That we learn to perceptualize, to make all our senses acute to that what we are inwardly, and to bring that out. That stimulates then that regular flow of the energy in which we exist of. When they say Jack Schwartz has pain control, it is exactly that 
Well, it says, however, the moment I achieve control, that's when I start losing control. See, that's the paradox. That's the paradox. The moment I start voluntarily regulating my body to fulfill its function without interference, that's the moment I give over control. You see, it is the difference between the recognition of what am I and as what am I represented in this physical world. You only know my I self, my Jack Schwartz self. That's the one you meet. That's the one you recognize. It is actually, as Martin Buber, in his book, I and Thou, makes it a very strong differentiation between that what we represent in this physical world and that what we are in the sense of the universal existence. That essential energy out of which we exist, which will continue to exist even if that vehicle is a long, a long time already on the racking pile. that it is a transpersonal self which really becomes the one which trusts that I self, that Jack Schwartz self, that body self to do the job. That when the Jack Schwartz, was the I self, withdraws itself from telling this body based upon belief systems to begin with, not based upon knowing systems, that this body then starts to wreck regulate itself. When I was in the Manager Foundation, I was do, doing these demonstrations and this research with the needles and some other interesting little body, uh, you can say body afflictions being brought on to me either by myself or by some assistant researchers who were doing it to my body, being hooked up to all these different instruments. It is at those times then that when they ask me, oh, okay, Jack, how does that feel? I said, well, let me check with my body. Let, my, let me ask my body how it feels to my body. Because I have to really start paying attention now to it because I am not there. It is not that I'm putting a needle in my arm, in my arm, because that's why you would not do it, because it is your arm. <laughs> so the only thing you have to do is to depersonify from that arm and say, I'm the driver, and it is done to my vehicle, my car, my instrument of expression. So that, therefore, you are not going to become suddenly, oh my, my goodness, what are we doing to me? So self-regulation comes down to be able to become, and it's a big word, which doesn't mean ignoring, ignoring it or being ignorant of, but it means becoming non-attached. To get totally busy beyond that physical structure. Because that body is very, very, very wise. It knows exactly how and when and where. It is our constant interfering based upon, as I said, of the belief systems that this is that what would happen. You have to realize when I was a young toddler too, as a matter of fact, I was even more so aware, made aware of all the bad things that could happen to my body. Because I was brought up in a home where my mother from birth was bedridden, was diagnosed to have tuberculosis, and it meant that we as children in the home every three months had to be checked out because that was a contagious disease. So we living in her environment, we had to be checked out that we would not have it too. And all kinds of interesting things were being told to us what we should do. I, for instance, and now remember, I lived in Holland. And my house was in the middle of the meadows. And if you know a little bit about Holland, that is water country. The meadows are surrounded by canals. And we had roadways to go to school. But no Dutch boy would go over the roadway to school. He would go through the meadows and jump the canals. So I was told, you know, now be careful, Jack. If you get wet feet, you will get tuberculosis. 
Now he says to a boy who is going to jump canals every day, not to get wet feet. And of course, I never got wet feet because I was giving special socks which would cover my knees so that he wouldn't catch a cold. <laughs> and I had him up all the way to my, to my hips till I was outside the house and then I rolled him down in order not to be looking foolish to the rest of the boys. And then I would jump the canals and of course from the 100 times you jumped, 90 times you jumped in the canal and 10 times you really made it. So I had stolen a pair of socks and put them in a tool shed and when I would come home at night I knew they were going to feel my feet if they were wet or not and then they would rush me to the doctor if I had wet feet and check me out for tuberculosis so I hid my socks in the tool shed and when I would come home we get my wet socks off my dry socks on and I would come in and I would already offer my feet to feel how brave I was <laughs> I had dry feet so I had no tuberculosis so you see, I was brought up like everybody else, do this, do that, and don't do this, and don't do that. And that was all knowledge giving till I started to realize, you know, that because of my inner knowing that I was not going to be affected by anything which I didn't allow to be affected by, that I had to stay in a constant state of very high energy to be excited by everything so that I would build up so that the energy kept flowing and is not stagnated. And I realized that fear, because of the belief systems, that fear was actually the one really what brought us down to that stagnating field. That what we were afraid of, we were afraid of the changes. If we didn't know in advance what the result was doing, we were not going to do anything. So therefore, the fear of change was really the cause that we didn't regulate ourselves anymore. Or actually, we did regulate ourselves so much that we regulate ourselves to be stagnated. That's also a form of self-regulation. It's either switching the light on or switching the light off. Well, I happen to have chosen to switch the light on and not to stagnate that what I was, that what needed to be done, and to be excited about the new ventures of life which could be about. And through that I started to realize that, how did I do this? That I would but damage my body and still not have the pain? Well, it is kind of a logical thing when you suddenly are in a situation where you are in an accidental state by which you injure yourself and pain comes from that. You didn't know this in advance and so therefore the pain will be there. But if you are going to damage your body purposely in order to prove pain control, there is a totally different situation. So I realize it is not good to do this in the laboratory if you cannot put this in practicality. And so I start to realize, what is pain? What is this pain? Well, the pain is letting me know that there is disharmony between my mind, my Tao self, my transpersonal self, and my I self, my body self. It is not at ease. There's some stagnation. Now, why allow this then to go on and keep telling you that and spend all this attention to the telling that there is disharmony but not doing anything about the disharmony and finding out where did I stagnate? Where did I influence that energy not to flow anymore? And as you know, that uh, if you look at your own daily life, you know, we constantly are so warned for all the bad things what can happen to us that we drive as our foot on the accelerator all the way to the floorboard, but the other foot is right on the brake too to make sure that we hold back too, you see. So, and then we are surprised that our engine burns up that the pistons don't work any good. And the same thing is with the body, that unless we can bring forth the self-knowing to be able to expand our beingness through the perceptualization capacity, that no matter what is happening in your life, you can create, we are now using for sport and for, for corporations and for all kinds of situations, we're using perceptualization. 
even though that you don't know the results from a conscious level, you can practically perceive these results or the results how you are going to act in a specific situation if you can do a mental, emotional perceptualization in which all the senses are activated and by which you put it out there, by which you create an outside beingness of yourself. And then let that one experience, and I mean experience every step of that particular idea what you want to be fulfilled. And we're doing this, for instance, in our center when we let people go through the exercises like aerobics. And we might put the aerobic pictures just on a screen, not even animated. And we let people gaze at that for a little while and then ask them to close their eyes and now put themselves down on the screen and do it. And when we hook them up to all the physiological indices, it is interesting to see them that their bodies start to respond as if they really were doing that particular sport. And so they are training themselves and it doesn't necessarily have to be a sport. It can be done for anything, for any part of your body can be activated. Any stagnation in your beingness can be activated by the putting it outside yourself, perceptualization, and total, total fulfillment of that particular act. Then whenever is anything wrong with the body, then the healing means that we are restoring that regular flow of that energy as it comes in, but also flows out again. And gives it its full capacity to function. And that is an exciting thing every time again when you have that result right there in front of you. You feel it, you know it. You know that you are in charge. And that you indeed have the fears, but you are now using the fears. You use the fears as an incentive, as a springboard for an action, rather than as a holding back and becoming inactive. It's the same thing that I have quite often said to people, what sounds very paradoxical, I'm a very dissatisfied, content person. That sounds strange to most people, very paradoxical again. What do I mean by that? Well, everything I'm doing, even what I'm doing at this moment with you, I am dissatisfied about. And you say, I don't notice that you're dissatisfied. No, you don't notice I'm dissatisfied and because I'm not being stopped by the dissatisfaction. Because I'm content, because I know I'm doing the best I can for now. Which is not good enough for two seconds after now. So now I can use my dissatisfaction by going to the wailing wall and asking myself why I didn't do better. Or why did I do it this way or that way or that way? Because they had told me if you say this and you do that, then it will come out that way. And now I am dissatisfied because I haven't followed up to that knowledge. No, but I have followed up to the knowingness and spontaneously expressed that what needs to be done. But I'm dissatisfied with it because I know it can still be better. You know, and this is the fantastic thing to me. When we talk about self-healing, that makes it whole continuously. It's getting to a better state. And none of us know what the better state is. That makes it even more fun. It is not for nothing that it says in some of the scriptures, the best is yet to be, and I really believe that's the carrot God hangs in front of our face. Because we hear all these people say from perfectionism. Well, what is perfect? The perfect is that what is the best you can do at this particular moment and recognizing that is not good enough for the next minute. That's the level of perfection. And you know, that is perfection for self-approval. In all the psychosomatic research we have done, we have found that most of the things we do, we don't do for ourselves. We do it to impress others rather than to impress ourselves. 
And it is such a fantastic thing to be able to impress yourself. To every time discover this capacity, this potential to be unleashed, that you are so alive and that you have the power within you to flow with this energy and that nothing can hold you back. And to make yourself immune from anything what is beyond you and what is seemingly affecting you. Do you realize that all what affects you is because you allow it to be affecting you? You know, it is such a very simple thing, this self-regulation and self-healing, that I really have to search for words because it is so simple, but I know we are such a complex people that unless you get it dished up in a complex way, you feel that it is not simple enough. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> because it is, it is such a simple thing to recognize this tremendous feeling of energy and power to be applied and to be setting it beyond your own beingness. It is not for nothing that we call a healthy person a radiant person. What do we mean with that? That that person radiates out energy, that it emanates energy, and that it is of a high power or voltage. Even in medicine, when you don't feel good, and when you have lost your, your radiance, and you eventually see your physician, he might even check you out and give you the final decision and says, you are low in resistance. He even used that electrical term, low resistance, low voltage, low radiation, low output. Why? Because you're holding on to it. You see, when you say, I don't have energy, in reality you're saying, I'm not using my energy, I'm preserving it. Because I don't know if I let it go, what happens to it. Can you imagine if the sun start acting this way? <laughs> really? You think the sun knows what is happening with it when it shines? So why do you want to know what your shine is going to do? You're going to make some people darn happy with your sunshine. And that's what you create in a high resistance level. And you know, ask any scientist, will tell you that it is impossible to introduce a lower energy field into a higher energy field. So what is the job of self-healing and self-regulation? To maintain that high energy field. You know, and then you become so adapted to your own growth state, there is very little what can affect you then anymore. You know, if you would stand here then on this place where I am and they would all start booing at you or running out of the auditorium and you don't know why they leave. They might just have to go party or they might just want a hot dog. You don't know that, but you and me, oh my goodness, they don't like what I'm doing. This is, if you are in that high energy field and you spontaneously let come out what you are, 